Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's uh, virtual conference on imaging cancer. Uh, my name is Eric Sahai, and I will be uh, chairing uh, the first part of this, and then I will hand over to one of my colleagues, uh, Sarah Bondiek, who will chair the second part of this session. Before we get started with the sort of exciting scientific talks, I'd like to make a few uh, introductory remarks. The first is to say that this is a program that has been put together by the European Association for Cancer Research and the European Society for Oncologic Imaging. And um, in addition to uh, myself and Sarah, uh, Heinz-Peter Schlemmer and Daniele Rege were uh, involved in the organizing committee for this meeting. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, my fellow uh, organizers uh, before we get started. Um, the other thing to say is that we had been uh, hoping to have an in-person conference uh, in September, but obviously the uh, situation with COVID has precluded this. So uh, we are running this uh, virtual conference today and there will be an in-person conference uh, postponed by I think about 18 months or so. So um, we should uh, get started very shortly, but there's just a few housekeeping uh, remarks to make. And that is that the uh, talks are meant to be 20 minutes long with uh, a very generous 20 minutes allowed for questions. So the idea is that this should be a particularly sort of interactive session. We do uh, really encourage you to uh, you know, ask questions and there is a Q&A tool that uh, you should have uh, access to. Uh, then uh, if you have a microphone available, uh, the chair will invite you to uh, ask your question. Uh, if you don't, the chair will then um, read out your question on your behalf uh, for the speaker to answer. Um, I will very quickly run through the programme. First of all, we have uh, Peter Friedel kicking off, who will tell us about uh, intravital imaging for uh, bone metastasis and therapy responses. Uh, then Simon Walker Samuel, who will tell us about combining mechanistic modelling, machine learning, and biomedical imaging to probe the tumour microenvironment and once again think about therapy responses. Uh, we then have a uh, industry sponsored uh, symposium. Uh, by Fluidine with Laura Kut uh, talking about uh, 3D imaging of the tumour microarchitecture. And um, there's a, a, you know, a new in innovation associated with this that Fluidine will be hosting a virtual booth. And uh, Claire Sullivan from the EACR, who is uh, coordinating all of this afternoon's events, uh, should be able to help if there are any questions about accessing that. Uh, we then uh, transition over to uh, Jason Lewis, who has very kindly uh, agreed to step in at rather short notice in place of uh, Julie Sutcliffe, and he will tell us about imaging serum biomarkers. Uh, and then finally, I will conclude uh, with a uh, presentation on imaging metab metabolic heterogeneity. Um, don't worry if the program looks, you know, rather kind of uh, dense. There will be uh, five minute breaks between uh, each of the talks just to go and you know, grab a cup of tea or coffee or uh, go for a comfort break or just uh, stretch your legs. Um, so I think I've covered uh, the main things that we uh, need to do in terms of uh, housekeeping. And um, I don't know if uh, Sarah, as the uh, this afternoon's co-chair, just wants to say hello or wave or add any other comments. I just uh, thanks, Eric, and uh, it's great to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the program. So I will uh, let you carry on sharing the first half, and I'll look forward to taking over a bit later. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Sarah. So I think uh, without further ado, we should uh, crack on uh, to our first speaker, who is uh, Peter Friedel uh, from the Netherlands. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing him tell us about engineering intravital microscopy models for bone metastasis and therapy response. So uh, Peter, the uh, floor is yours, so to speak. Good afternoon, everybody. Do you see my screen? I don't see anything. OK, yes, I, assume, you I assume you hear me. So w welcome, everybody, uh, to this presentation which is a little bit off the road of what my lab normally does. Usually we look into a natural environment and try to get the nature visualized by intravital microscopy as much as possible. But in order to reach a hidden niche, and in this case, it's the bone marrow, 
underneath the cortical bone, sometimes you have to invent something and engineer your model. So I'm gonna lead you through this, how engineering leads to um, new insights into um, cancer biology. This work was supported in a kind with reagents by Bayer, uh, providing radium, and very recently also financial support. None of our other supporters um, were involved in this project as which I'm presenting today. So we do intravital microscopy, and the first part I would like to share with you about um, imaging biomaterials. So that's the multifocal microscope we are using. We put a mouse underneath to recapitulate the human disease, hopefully, and use high power lasers in order to see a rich um, inventory of tissue and cell structures. We use for that second and third harmonic generation, which are signals that a uh, multiphoton excitation exquisitely generates. Uh, it enables to see the extracellular matrix, um, myofibers, perfused blood vessels, adipocytes, tumor microvesicles, and the cells therein by fluorescence. Second and third harmonic generation microscopy is also very powerful to visualize implant material. So I tell you in a moment why we did that. Uh, this is polycaprone lactone, uh, a plastic material, and you see second and third harmonic generation signals coming from the scaffold. PSU, PET, PLGA, broadly used um, biomaterials in the implantation field generate very good a second and third harmonic generation. So we thought that a nice technical tweak here could be to implant this material and see how the body responds to this implant material in a um, living mouse uh, going through a window. That's the polycaprone lactone scaffold. We actually wanted to see its degradation. So that's the implant material. After a while, we are getting, um, within a few days, uh, infiltrate cells. That's an inflammatory response. Then we see the inflammation aggregate around the scaffold. New vessels come in. And the greenish part here is a collagen formation, which is fibrosis visualized here. But we could not see any degradation of the scaffold. So what we see here in a nutshell is called foreign body response. The body deals with a material that cannot be degraded, like here, a silicone implant that has uh, generated a fibrotic capsule around it. And in the end, it's gonna be like a tennis ball and has to be removed. So the silicone and uh, materials from the implant dis uh, are eliciting this fibrotic response, which is initiated by inflammation. The inflammation, and this is a short loop, a time-lapse movie that we generated in this model, um, starts with the integration of mononucleated cells, which are mostly neutrophils and macrophages, monocyte macrophages. The macrophages then end up on top of the scaffold. And uh, this leads to the fusion of individual macrophages and a further aggregation. So they form a cell code around this implant material. So after a couple of days, the material is totally hidden and just a cell sleeve is protecting it or shielding it from the rest of the body. We get a neoangiogenesis response and at some point we also get the fibrosis, a fibrotic capsule around the problem. So quantifying all this um, allows to show the dynamics of the infiltrate cells as they approach the scaffold material and then complete arrest of migration and stability of uh, interaction. We never saw um, a giant cell that once touched this scaffold leave it again. So they arrest and they become resident. We looked into it and realized, uh, reading the literature, that we are agnostic about whether the giant cells and the macrophages are actually drivers of the process, or they create pathogenesis, or whether they reduce the fibrotic response. So we decided to look into this mechanistically, first by forming, uh, doing immunostainings. So here is um, M1 versus M2 stainings, and we see that those multinucleated giant cells are of the M1 phenotype, which is the inflammatory phenotype, but not M2. And moreover, 
these uh, multinucleated giant cells and also the macrophages release or produce VEGF, vascular endothelial derived growth factor A, which is driving angiogenesis. So it drives inflammation. And depleting the macrophages using clodron A liposomes, which kills the macrophages for a while, um, eliminates also the VEGF production in this area. So we decided to look at the effects uh, on fibrosis. If we use clodronate liposomes compared to the control scaffold, and this is just explanted material, and you see it's transparent and not red, no vasculogenesis, and very little fibrosis. We also inhibited um, angiogenesis by neutralizing VEGF with an antibody, VEGF trap. And you also see a transparent scaffold without much collagen and without neoangiogenesis, no reddish and combined the two. And when we did this therapeutic approach and combined it with intramital vital microscopy, we found that not only the inflammation, which is shown here, in either approach is greatly diminished. So this is the inflammatory response in control mice, and that's with clotronate VGF trap or the combination therapy. But also the neoangiogenesis is greatly diminished, and the fibrotic encapsulation of the material is almost ablated. So this is reticular collagen as we have it in the non-inflamed uh, regular dermis, um, but this is the encapsulation. And you see here a later time point, the same result. So we could greatly diminish collagen deposition uh, by reducing the macrophage count or the availability of macrophages to be recruited to the inflammatory side which then leads to the concept that actually the giant cells and macrophages are drivers of the foreign body response by releasing VEGF that brings in neo vessels. They allow more cells to come in and jointly this allows uh, for the fibrotic or drives the fibrotic response. So any intervention either of the VEGF release or the presence of the macrophages at early time points will reduce fibrosis. So why did we do this? Uh, we were after visualizing bone, and you will see in a moment the PCL scaffold is a very good starting point for engineering a bone. So why bone metastasis is so problematic? Uh, after the tumor cells arrive, they sit in a niche called the endosteal niche between vessels and endosteum. They can be dormant, then they are not a big clinical problem. But the moment the dormant cells grow out, from micrometastasis or macrometastasis, uh, they remodel the bone or stimulate bone cells to remodel it and create a clinical problem. So we've decided to look into the therapy, the growth and therapy response of prostate cancer that metastasizes to the bone. And in order to validate the model that you're going to see in a moment, we checked uh, two types of therapies. One is solidronic acid, solidronate, which inhibits osteoclast-based remodeling of the bone, so the bone degradation is inhibited, or radium. Um, radium is an, an alpha-emitting radiotherapeutic agent that localizes to bone and bombards the bone environment and thereby kills the tumor. Bone models are difficult and challenging. You can make a tibia window, but this is good for a couple of hours. You cannot monitor reliably tumor biology. And so a longitudinal imaging is also very difficult. Alternatively, there is the Calvaria model, uh, which allows through a window to look into the cavity, bone marrow cavities of the skull bone. However, this is good for leukemia models or stem cell biology, but not so much for solid tumors. So in order to get something um, robust for larger tumors, we took a model from Dietmar Hutmacher and Boris Holzapfel from Brisbane, who were willing to collaborate with us on this by engineering the scaffolds that are ex vivo conditioned with human mesenchymal stem cells that form osteoblast-like cells, implant the scaffold into the mouse, into the skin, at a place where you can put a window, an imaging window later on, implant the tumor into what's then the ossicle, and monitor the biology 
using intravital microscopy in a window that we on plan. So the novelty here is that we use Dietmar Huckmacher's model, made it very small so it fits, fits into an imaging model. And then with intravital microscopy, visualize the biology. After a while, we realized we don't need this ex vivo or in vitro conditioning, and we implanted the scaffold with BMP7 directly. And we got, and this is magic almost, an ossicle underneath the skin in the flank of the mouse. So that's a CT scan. And you can see this new bone forms within four weeks. These are the phases of development of this new bone. It's like a micro of about four millimeters in length and one and a half millimeters in thickness. It contains mature bone marrow, it, which contains osteoblasts, osteoclasts, trabecular bone, normal vascularization, and also stem cells that repopulate the bone marrow after transplanting the content of the ossicle to recipient sublethally irradiated mice. So in other words, it's a bone with a thin cortical lamella and viable, fully mature bone marrow. Why go through the pain? Here is the selling point. Because the cortical bone of our implanted uh, bone material is very thin and the volume is thick, we have a very good proportion to implant a solid tumor and also to visualize through the, the, the biology through the intact bone. So here we have a uh, comparison to the tibia, the cortex is too thick. The vertebra, it's too complicated as a, a geometrical unit. And the calvaria, which has a very thin, um, um, a very thin um, a cortical bone. However, it has almost no lumen. So there is no space for the tumor to, to grow. So this ossicle combines the advantage of a thin lamella and a big volume. So then we implant the tumor. The tumor grows very similar to the tibia. We also uh, do intravital microscopy right afterwards and go through the intact bone, which is here in purple. And we look into the tumor through the intact bone, roughly 100 microns in depth, and extract a couple of parameters like the nuclei of the tumor cells, the cytosol. Um, these are blood vessels visualized through dextran plus phagocytes that take up the dextran, second harmonic of the bone, and third harmonics is an interface signal, and we can see osteocytes here. So it's the endosteal niche, roughly 100 microns underneath the bone lamella that we can visualize nicely. It gets much better if the tumor is osteolytic, so we have a little hole, and in in the whole, we have crisp, very crisp imaging conditions. So we can go, that's actually the optical window, and you see the fluorescence shimmering through and the, the tumor is osteolytic. And then we go in and uh, using a catepsin K sensor, we can visualize the osteoclast sitting here and resolving the bone. Uh, Osteosense visualizes a recent, that's the whitish signal, recently remodeled bone and the tumors as well. This is the osteolytic interface by histology. And we also see the osteolytic tumor uh, bone interface by intravital microscopy. We benchmarked the dimensions and found that it's roughly a 50 micron uh, distance between the tumor compartment and the actual bone interface. And this is where the osteoclasts do their business. They do their business by sitting there. They are mostly resident cells. Um, however, they have some kinetics, which is a ruffling extension and retraction of cell extensions, which we quantified here by particle imaging velocimetry, which is uh, quantified down here. And then we treat it with soledronate, which inhibits osteoclasts without killing them. So here we have a control osteolytic hole, which grows in size. So this is um, not a one-to-one -one ratio, be aware. And directly after adding soledronate, we don't get any growth anymore of the osteolytic niche. Um, so the lesion remains stable. And when inhibiting the osteoclasts, we noted that their kinetics using particle imaging velocimetry is greatly halted. So the fast um, components of their behavior, which is the oscillation of the extensions, is practically abolished with soledronate. This shows, it's shown in that movie. So here we have control, 
overviews. It's a 40 minute loop. I apologize, it's pretty short, uh, but you can see a greatly dynamic overview in control situation and with bisphosphonate treatment, they are more or less frozen and are more stable and more anchored to the bone. While the density of osteoclasts didn't change with the solitronate treatment and also the tumor growth in mitotic and apoptotic activity has not changed at all. So what we now using this uh, proof of concept approach can show is that the osteoclast biology can be uncoupled from the tumor growth. We stabilize the bone, but we don't affect the tumor in, at all. So to go towards another type of therapy, we used radium, which is an FDA approved uh, therapy um, that emits alpha particles. It is enriched like calcium in the bone and in clinical studies prolongs lives of uh, prostate cancer patients uh, by three to four months. So we wanted to identify whether the options or the effects of radium are largely indirect, so it reprograms the stroma somehow and causes a growth delay, or whether it's directly toxic to tumor cells. So we implanted first the, the, the tumor into the tibia, added the radium and looked at the growth. This is bioluminescence imaging and you see radium works. So this is the controlled untreated tumor and uh, with radium we have um, a growth deficit, which is dose dependent. So the more radium we give, the better it works. However, there is at some point a plateau and there is also a certain time window only of a single dose being efficient, which is a couple of days. Half-life of radium is 11 days. So we settled for a dose which is 385 kilobecquerel per kilogram um, body weight and did intravital microscopy to see where is radium actually doing what. This is the bone interface. These are the tumor cells. We, we looked at autotic figures and also mitotic figures and intact nuclei. We simply counted stuff. And this is the zonal analysis of apoptosis and proliferation events in red versus green respectively. And we can see that there is a mitosis arrest very near the bone interface, but within 300 microns, mitotic events are just unperturbed. And apoptosis is induced very nearby the bone interface, but within 300 microns away from the bone interface, there is no apoptosis induction left. So that means that radium works only in a very narrow corridor nearby the bone, but not in the big tumor center. So we try to get more insight into this, whether radium alone can just kill the tumor cells and it created an agent-based model in collaboration with Stefano Kasarin from Methodist in Houston. And uh, here's the total model just published uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this model has been then allowed, uh, allowed us uh, to um, generate a tumor in silico bombarded with radium and monitor the zones that the radium, the differential therapy response that the radium induces. We match the growth curves in vivo compared to in silico. We also look at the half-life of radium as it is in vivo and the apoptosis in mitotic events relative to the distance from the bone. Um, and then the model can visualize where we have apoptosis relative to the bone interface. And the closer we go to the bone, the better the response is. The further away we are from the bone, the lower the response is, just like it is all in vivo. Here's the movie, untreated tumors grow. And with the radium, we have a growth delay for a couple of days, and then the radium um, is not effective anymore and the tumor takes over. So now the question, the final data piece I would like to share with you is how the size of the tumor affects the efficacy of radium. So big tumors versus small tumors modeling uh, in silico shows that the smaller the tumor gets, the better the response to radium is, whereas the large tumors don't respond at all anymore. This has to do with the volume fraction of the tumor being close to the bone. The more tumor is close to the bone, the more likely the radium kills the tumor cell. And the best result we got with very small tumors like four or a single cell 
where we could eradicate the tumor even in a, in a great percentage. So the model shows here, so I, there's something here always in the way. So you can see here the tumor initially is small. Here is the small tumor. And then after a couple of days, the radium eliminates the tumor. So the prediction is that micro lesions are controlled by radium, but not macro, macro tumors. So we went back to the mouse, implanted 100,000 up to 1.5 million cells, large tumors, small tumors. And you can see already the effect size is perfect uh, by radium when we have a small tumor. But there is no response at all if this, it's an overload of tumor cells. So the relative efficacy of a single radium dose is biggest, minus 85% growth when you have a small lesion, but the bigger lesions don't respond anymore. And that's the end point of a small lesion, a small little tumor um, histologically, whereas the big lesions don't respond at all. You see no difference between the radium. Whereas here you see the untreated tumor is quite big compared to the small micro lesion after radium treatment. Starting point really matters. So it means that using intravital microscopy, we can generate um, a model uh, with an engineered bone that predicts the clinical response of radium. Uh, it's a direct cytotoxic event that is sufficient to eradicate small tumors, but not big tumors. And this has to do with how many tumor cells we have near the end osteal niche, so where the radium is really located. So we can conclude that clinically, uh, it would be better to have micro lesions treated with radium rather than macro lesions. I'm done. I thank you for your attention. But before I let you go, I have to thank a lot Stephanie Alexander, who started this project uh, on bone imaging and the foreign body response. It was taken over by Eleonora Dondosola, who was supported by Martina and Claudia. And she carried the entire project, including the in silico modeling in collaboration uh, with Stefano Casarin. Bettina and Khadian generated uh, the second and third harmonic technology, and the funders, particularly the Prostate Cancer Foundation and the Anderson and the David Koch uh, Center for, support, uh, for supporting this project. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I look very much forward to hear your question, and I hope it'll work out technically. Thank you. Okay. I will give you a, a virtual round of applause, Peter. Thank you for that uh, very nice and clear presentation. So we've got about 15 minutes for questions and uh, discussion. So I can already see that one question has come in and uh, I will read it out. It's from uh, Laila Ritzma. Um, and the question is, as radium eliminates mostly small tumors, do you think that radium might be very effective way to eliminate uh, single dormant cells that reside in the bone marrow? In principle, I think that a single dormant tumor cells would be a perfect target for radium the moment uh, they sit nearby the endosteal niche. So the, the literature is not very uniform about where the dormant cells are actually sitting, but uh, it looks like a big proportion really sits in between vessels and the endosteal niche. Um, by bone marrow aspirate, we lose topology, but um, histologically, I, at least I've heard of a couple of examples that indeed they might sit quite close to the bone, to the osteoblastic niche. So if that were the case, then radium would be a, a stronghold uh, for high-risk patients where we have a high load of uh, circulating tumor cells and um, a, a bigrading a high risk for metastatic bone disease. So it could actually go into um, a preventive direction even. Okay, thank you. I think I'm seeing a message that uh, Claire might like to uh, make a comment, perhaps an organizational one. Uh, okay, I guess not. Perhaps I misinterpreted the message. Um, so uh, we have a, another question from Julia uh, Hobart. Uh, apologies if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. Uh, so first of all, thank you for a very clear presentation. And then are you planning on investigating the effects of uh, rank ligand inhibitors uh, using your methodology? Yes, indeed. 
uh, we are planning. Uh, the, the usual suspects uh, would be interesting to see. Um, so go through um, standardized protocols and see which niche responds to what. We have rank, rank ligand interactions. Uh, we have uh, HF targeting, uh, CMET targeting. So we have a couple of, of suspects on our to-do list, but we haven't started yet. Great, thank you. So I had a, a couple of questions. Um, so the first is, do you um, see a sort of a divergent fate upon the seeding of the prostate cancer cells, some of which kind of actively outgrow and some of which sit there as more indolent cells? Or do they all kind of outgrow in the same way? So maybe I should make a, um, a technical disclaimer here. What I just showed to you are implanted tumors, both for the tibia and for the ossicle. Um, we, we started uh, looking at hematogenously originating micro lesions and tumors in both the tibia model and the uh, ossicle, uh, but it's, it's like finding and uh, trying to find a needle in the haystack because the cells arrive somewhere randomly and it is very difficult to really get them by intravital microscopy. So I cannot answer any question about kinetics of recently arriving cells um, using intravital microscopy. For that, we'd have to invent yet another model that gives us a, a much stronger overview um, and large field imaging uh, of recently arriving cells in the, in the vasculature. So I'm, I'm sorry, I have no clue. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question. Um, I'm not sure if this person has a microphone. It's from Adele Zaid Ishmael Mutaha. Uh, if you have a microphone, would you like to try to ask your question, Adele? Okay, I guess if not, I will read the question out. Uh, the question is, what about radium toxicity? Uh, I guess, does your model allow you to evaluate potential side effects of the therapy? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so in patients, radium is, is extremely well tolerated, surprisingly well tolerated, very little myelose toxicity, very little bone marrow suppression. Um, however, also the prostate specific, prostate specific antigen levels are, are mostly unperturbed. So in patients, it's well tolerated. Uh, in the mice, uh, we have no side effects as far as we can tell, which probably has to do with the homing of the radium molecules exactly to the regions of bone turnover, like calcium voodoo. Uh, so um, other effects we are interested in, and Eleonora is pursuing this in an independent project at the moment, is about uh, general bone effects on the bone marrow. If you add radium to a non-tumor bearing bone or bone marrow, um, and uh, yeah, there is no clear answer right now, but uh, it's, it's in, in the making. And we'll also have a look at how radium will perturb immunotherapy, targeted immunotherapy and cytotoxic effector function, whether it helps or not, and whether it can be combined potentially. So it's in the making, and uh, we hope in a couple of years we'll have good answers to this. All right, thank you. Um, I can see there's another question from Jennifer Ashworth. Um, and as she doesn't have a microphone, I will read uh, the question out. So, uh, thank you for the talk. What do you think are the main mechanisms behind the decreasing effect of radium further from the bone? Is this due to uh, penetration into the tumors or other factors such as hypoxia in the tumors? Yeah, so I thank you for this question. I actually forgot to mention that alpha particles have a, 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 a travel distance in uh, aqueous solution or in the tissue of roughly 100 microns one to maybe 200 microns. So the zone of direct cytotoxicity that we mapped by intravital microscopy is in perfect line with the predicted flight distance the alpha particles generate. We didn't, we were not able to visualize alpha particle flight travel distances uh, by intravital microscopy yet, but there are data from um, overlay systems with um, um, alpha particle sensitive films. Uh, and they also talk about 100 to 200 microns of travel distance. So we think that the, the limited um, space range 
of radium therapy has to do with the physical principle. It's not like gamma irradiation that flies through the tissue, the entire tissue, but it's really the, the short distance of alpha particles being effective in the tissue. And kind of linked to that question, do you have a, um, a kind of a smart way of evaluating hypoxia through intravital imaging? So there are a couple of probes um, around that you could use. I must admit that uh, none of them we found very satisfying uh, ourselves when we tried them. Uh, so the short answer is we do still immunohistochemistry. We, we stain for carboanhydrase 9 as a hypoxia-related molecule that's upregulated uh, in hypoxic regions. And then we correlate the immunohistochemistry slices with the intravital data. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from uh, Sibel Sina Asa. Uh, again, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, and they're asking about the, uh, I guess, application of intravital microscopy to soft tissue tumors as well. Um, I guess it'd be good if you could comment upon that. So I, I thank you very much for this question. I think later on, for instance, in Eric's talk, you will see more intravital microscopy in soft tissue. Um, this is where we come from. So traditionally, the field has focused on um, skin tumors, um, brain tumors, uh, so soft tissue throughout, uh, whereas the models for bone tumors uh, are very, very limited. Uh, therefore, indeed, there is a wealth of literature on intravital microscopy in soft tissue tumors. Wherever you can put a window on, the mammary gland, the pancreas, the liver, uh, you can see uh, the, the tumor biology directly. And uh, indeed, so if you're, if you're interested in that, just make a little Google search and you'll find hundreds of papers in that direction. And I guess perhaps if I could you know, add a comment, I think uh, in, in the tumor imaging field, we've also been taking a little bit of a lead, both from you know, the neurobiology community that has done a lot of pioneering work in intravital imaging of this sort and also the immunology community that's done a lot of work on leukocyte trafficking and dynamics within in lymph nodes. Um, so uh, yeah, this type of imaging is uh, widely used for, for many diverse tissues as Peter says. And uh, maybe not to forget the wound healing community uh, where you implant uh, some epidermal layers and then you will look at uh, the closure of wounds and uh, 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 wound respo wounding responses of, of all kinds. Um, bone healing is also something where intravital microscopy now comes in. So yeah, I, I can see practically every field being populated by intravital microscopy uh, with the soft tissues being the most, uh, most successful ones so far. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll just kind of ask if there are any more questions. Do, um, you know, don't be shy. Do uh, jump in and ask a uh, question if you have one. I'll just uh, see if anything pops up in the next 10 seconds. Um, if not, well then I'd like to uh, thank you again, Peter, for uh, such a stimulating and clear presentation. Um, and it's been uh, good to see you uh, virtually. Um, we now have a sort of, uh, I think, sort of six or seven minute break, which is a sort of opportunity to uh, stretch your legs. Please do come back in um, six or seven minutes so that we're all ready and uh, raring to go to hear from Simon Walker Samuel, who will uh, talk to us about combining mechanistic modeling, machine learning, and biomedical imaging to probe the tumor microenvironment and assess response to treatment. So uh, let's reconvene in six or seven minutes. I uh, look forward to catching up again then.